right, let's take our Bibles and look in Luke chapter 24. There are a number of portions we could look at when we we're talking about our Lord's ascension. And you may be wondering, well, why is this in the series on miracles? Well, I don't know about you, but when uh, he was there with his disciples and given his final instructions and then as a man literally floated up into the air they were in such amazement seeing this that while they gazed stood there gazing two angels appeared and said why stand ye here gazing the Lord gave you specific instructions to go back to Jerusalem and wait for the coming of the spirit but they were in awe and I know I would be too this is something that had never been done before. Never has there before Christ ascended into heaven a man that from this earth ascended on up. And I know people are always quick to say, well, what about Elijah and what about Enoch? Well, we studied that already. Because Enoch, you read there in Hebrews 11, it says these all died in the faith. All it says about Enoch back there, and you can read it, is that he walked with God and was no more. So people just assume, well, he, he, he went up into heaven. No. Christ, that was reserved for Christ to be that first man. And Elijah, it says that the chariot came down and took him away. But I believe that the Lord just removed him from the prominent ministry and that mantle fell on Elisha. He was taken away and was hidden until such time as God was pleased to take him. And we'll see a, a scripture verse to that end where, where in John he says there, there's, there's no man prior to Christ ascending into heaven that ascended. So that's why I'm including this as the miracle of Jesus' ascension. But you look here in Luke chapter 24, of course, that's a precious chapter, how the Lord had appeared unto his disciples and had opened their eyes, the, their eyes of understanding in verse 45. Let's start there, Luke 24, that they might understand the scriptures. He said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Now, when it talks about open their understanding of the scriptures. What scriptures did they have at that time? The Old Testament. So all of this Christ was saying was foretold and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. That's what it was to be an apostle. They witnessed Christ's resurrection. They received directly from him this instruction. Some people say, well, why was Paul considered to be an apostle? Well, the Lord appeared unto him. And he was a witness of the resurrection. When Christ met him there on the road to Damascus, appeared to him, it was the very Christ whose death he had plotted. But the Lord said, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high and so he led them out as far as to Bethany and he lifted up his hands so this would have been a mountain near Bethany Bethany was just five miles from Jerusalem and he blessed them and it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them, and here's the miracle, and carried up into heaven. They can't even do that with jetpacks today. You get up so high, and then things starts going wacky, and next thing you know, is crash landing in the water. Here is our Lord, sovereign, creator of this world, and... At the end of his earthly ministry and work being carried up into heaven. And it says they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. 
and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So that's Luke's rendition. If you look over in Matthew chapter 28, and read verses 16 and 17, here we again, again we get a little bit more detail that verse 16 then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them and when they saw him they worshipped him but some doubted so it speaks specifically of the 11 that's because Judas would have already gone and hung himself killed himself and when it says some doubted, there were probably likely others there beside the 11 disciples that had followed him to this place. And that's where Jesus came and spake unto them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And that's an interesting verb, verse 19. It literally says, as you're going. As you are going about your business day to day. So this is, this is not a, a missionary call that everybody needs to go out. and, But as you go, therefore, teach all nations wherever you're placed. We know that the 11 apostles all went to different parts of the world. Thomas all the way over to India. And uh, the other disciples in different places baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. One name in the name of. Why the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Because that's who God is. He's the God of salvation, Father, Son, and Spirit. But teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Well, what did he commanded his disciples to go out and preach him and uh, preach his death? Christ and him crucified. And he says, Lo, I am with you always. So even though he would be in heaven, yet he would be with them by his spirit, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So following his resurrection from the dead, our Lord made a number of appearances to his followers. Actually, no less than 10 of these are recorded in scripture beginning on that resurrection day that first day of the week it says that he showed himself alive I'll look over in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3 so we're slowly encompassing all of these different portions that deal with Christ's post resurrection appearances but also his ascension here in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, and Luke would have been the one that wrote this book or treatise, it says, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, that is his death, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So for 40 days after his resurrection, our Lord was instructing his own, his apostles, and many other followers periodically during these 40 days. He didn't go back through the land and present himself to those that had crucified him and said, ah, here I am. No. When he rose, he went to his own. And some then believe that he, when he ascended, it would have been from Mount Olivet near Jerusalem while the apostles watched. And that's where we see this here. They had questions about the kingdom and when he would restore it. And he told them that that was not for them to know. But he says there in verse 8, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem 
in all Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. I believe those three divisions or patterns of where he would work, first Jerusalem in Judea, then Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. Three times through the book of Acts, there was an outpouring of the Spirit, what they call the baptism of the Spirit was outpouring. First was in Jerusalem. The next one was in Samaria in Acts 8. And then the last one was in Ephesus, Acts 19. And other than that, you don't have any more references to the outpouring of the Spirit. Today, people want to talk about being baptized with the Spirit, you know, as soon as you're converted. Look for that experience of speaking in tongues and all that. No, that's not why it was given. This was the Lord directing them as to where the gospel should be carried. And he was the one opening the doors, first in Jerusalem and Judea, then Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's the pattern of the book of Acts. But here's, here's again a little detail that you don't see in Matthew and Luke. When, he, when Luke wrote his gospel, but here in writing the, the book of the Acts, he says, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. <laughs> you can kind of picture this. It's almost humorous. Here they are looking up, and then suddenly there's two men standing by them in white apparel. And which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And that was all that they needed for reassurance. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. So it's very specific. Which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath's day journey. That would have been the distance between Bethany and, and Jerusalem. And there they waited as the Lord had said. So what we're seeing here were the last appearances of our Lord to these apostles before he ascended up into heaven. And just like with his death on the cross, every detail had to be finished before he would ascend. And just as important as the resurrection of Christ is to his death, the connection that he should not only die for the sins of his people, but be raised as evidence of their justification, like it says there in Romans 4. Even so, now the ascension of Christ should be connected to his resurrection. All of this was purposed by God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you look over there with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is the whole chapter of Paul writing to show that there was indeed a resurrection, a physical resurrection. And you can conclude along with this the importance of not only a physical resurrection, but a physical ascension of a man into heaven. Here it says in 1 Corinthians 15, let's we'll start in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. There's only one gospel. It pertains to the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and his ascension. It says, by, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. This is talking about those that give lip service, or head have head knowledge, but never been revealed in their heart. He said, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Remember, Paul initially was an enemy. And he would have been one of those promoting that the disciples had come and stolen the body of the Lord. That's the rumor that was going around because they didn't want to have to deal with a risen Savior. But now, Paul himself, a testimony, a witness, 
I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins, not how according to the scriptures. Not that he just died. People will say that. Why can't you just preach Christ died for sinners and don't be so specific? Well, because it says according to the scriptures. What do the scriptures say? Who he is, why he came, what he accomplished, for whom he did it, and where he is now. And that he was buried and he rose again the third day. Again, according to the scriptures. What scriptures? The Old Testament. All of this was written already. And that he was seen of Cephas, Peter. Then of the twelve. After that, he was seen above 500 brethren at once. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. I tend to think, you wonder, well, what happened to the Old Testament believers that came out of the graves and were walking around Jerusalem? They were brought forth from the graves, but they were still in earthly bodies. They would have had to have died again at some point and await the resurrection that we all await for at the end of time. And I would like to believe that some of these 500 were probably some of those were, that were witnesses of, of Christ's resurrection. Where it says, there of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. And after that he was seen of James and then all of the apostles. And then he says, and last of all he was seen of me also as of one born out of due season so here it explains how our lord was seen by all the apostles one more time even after his visit with james james was actually our lord's half brother he's the one that wrote the, the epistle of james but he was one of the brothers of jesus through mary and joseph and uh, here specifically, he refers to him that uh, it would have been one of these that he appeared unto. And so our Lord led the apostles as far as Bethany on the eastern side of Mount Olive near Jerusalem. And that's where he gave them their final instructions before ascending into heaven. And Paul takes his place, doesn't he, when he says there, then last of all, he recognized that that was a grace that he should even be considered an apostle. He obtained mercy, he says to Timothy, but as one born out of due time. And that appearance would have occurred while Paul then called Saul. That Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Greek name. And uh, while he was traveling to Damascus on a mission to persecute Christians, read about that in Acts chapter 9. All of this is such a beautiful story of things that the Lord was orchestrating and, and revealing himself and preparing these to go out and to preach in the world. But I believe for that reason, as much as I love to talk about the death of Christ, as much as I love to talk about his burial, his resurrection, his life leading up to his death on the cross, let's not forget that the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ into heaven is just as essential as all of that. Because he didn't just raise from the grave and then spend the rest of his life here on earth going about doing other things. We rightfully so focus on the crucifixion and the resurrection, but the ascension is pivotal especially as we've seen already in, in Luke's writings, not only in Acts, but in his gospel. So twice he makes mention of it there. Now, what I want us to do in the time that we have remaining is to understand the significance and importance of Christ's resurrection. Why was it essential that he ascend up into heaven? Let me give you three points here to consider. First, his ascension was vital in that this 
was proof positive that he was going back to the father who had sent him and that he would take his place, he would literally sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so how do we know that the father approved his work? Well, he welcomed him back. We read already where the angels looked into these things and wondered how it was this was their creator and yet he'd taken on the form of a man. But you can imagine the shouts, and there's some psalms that talk about that, the shouts that rang up into heaven when Christ entered back in and took his place, seated upon the throne, and from there poured out his spirit. That's what our Lord had told his disciples. That's why he said that it was good for them that he go away. Look over in John chapter 16. Now comes together all that the Lord had been teaching them leading up to his death and his burial, but they didn't understand it. This shows me that our salvation is not dependent upon a full understanding of the teachings of Christ. If that were the case, then none of us could even hope to be saved because I still continue to be a student of his word and his work, what he accomplished. But that didn't mean they were any the less the Lord's. That's why he came to pay their debt. That even in their ignorance, it was he that was doing the work on their behalf. But here in John chapter 16, if you go back there, you can see this is what he was teaching them. In verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. Not only go away to the cross, because he goes on and says, For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So even in that one statement, and then you can continue to read down to verse 16. He's preparing them not only for his death, going away to the cross, but also ultimately going away to the Father. And when he's come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. That word reprove is in the sense of a, in a court case, bring all of the conviction against the world that crucified him. And prove that... He was who he said he was. So they'd be reproved. That, that word means convicted in the sense of judged. Notice, it's the world of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see him no more. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. This is what our Lord accomplished. And yet the world rejected him and turned thumbs down on him. And so in God's court of law... The Spirit is the testifier. The Spirit is the key witness that comes against those that rejected him. But then it switches over where he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit how be when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you. So there's a difference in how the Spirit deals with the unbelieving world. He seals their condemnation. But for those for whom Christ paid the debt, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. You can see the difference. The spirit's not going around the world trying to get everybody converted. <laughs> Mark that down. No, he's got those for whom he was sent, that he guides into all truth teaching them even more clearly who Christ is and what he accomplished, why he did it, for whom he did it. But the rest of the world that condemned him, they'll remain in that state of condemnation. And so that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost, 10 days after Christ's ascension. That's what Penta means. Christ was on the earth for 40 days teaching his disciples, and then 10 days after, he poured out his spirit and that's why Peter connects our Lord's exaltation with the outpouring of the Spirit. You can see that in Acts chapter 2 
in verse 33. Look at Acts 2, 33. These are all connected. When the Spirit was poured out and they spoke in tongues, those were languages. People heard in their native languages where they had been scattered throughout the world the testimony of, of Christ through these apostles. And then Peter says here in Acts chapter, but he didn't preach about tongues. You see in verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. This is just 50 days since the crucifixion. So this is fresh on everybody's mind. And where does he lay the, lay the blame? With them, their wicked hands. But whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And he goes on to quote from the Psalms there. Verse 27 says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. That's the word Hades. That's Sheol. That's where Christ went those three days. People say, where was he? His body was in the grave, but his spirit went there to join with all of those that waited, had been waiting up to that time. But suddenly he appears unto them and announces that pretty soon they would be ascending with him, taking their souls with him into, into glory. And uh, then you read on down to verse 33. It says, well, verse 32, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we, we all are witnesses. Verse 33, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended in the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou upon my right hand, till I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know Assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. And that was the word that was used to prick their hearts. So that's the first significance of Christ's ascension. It's very much related to his finished work. That he should then having finished it ascend on up to his father. And uh, we know that he was received because... It says there, being therefore exalted the right hand of God and having received from the Father. He told them that he would send the Spirit, but the Father and the Son are one. From the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves have seen and hear. But secondly, the significance of Christ's ascension here is that it is through this then that all of the blessings of what he accomplished are now poured out upon his church, his people, those that he came to save. These aren't some general blessings. That he came, rose, and ascended on high, and now he's up there like throwing confetti out, you know, making people happy. No. Having accomplished the work of redemption, and God having justified once for all and forever his people there at the cross through his suffering. Here we see now the exalted Christ taking the fruit of his salvation that he won. This was a victory. This is like when he ascended back into glory. He's as one coming back from battle with his trophies. And now... We see that he grants gifts unto those for whom he paid the debt. You say, what gifts? How about repentance? How about faith? Over in Acts chapter 5, if you look there. And again, remember, Luke was the writer here of Acts. You can almost see how it was such a blessing for him to connect what he'd written in the gospel. Christ, of Christ's work before his ascension and now his work since his ascension. I know that people named this book Acts of the Apostles, but it's really Acts of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like the book of Revelation. It's not Revelations, by the way. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. One revelation. The glory of Christ. And here in Acts chapter 5 and verse 31... 
you can see here Peter's testimony when they were called to question into question as to you know why they were preaching Christ but you can see then Peter verse 29 and the other apostles answered and said we ought to obey God rather than men when they tried to quiet them the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom ye slew and hanged on a tree here it is verse 31 him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior notice for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins the forgiveness of sins was accomplished when Christ died on the cross the revelation of that now that Christ is seated in the heavens by his spirit it's the spirit that reveals unto those for whom he paid the debt that that forgiveness has already been granted and uh, that repentance is granted unto them in other words repentance as Paul describes it in Acts 20 21 is repentance toward God even faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ so that's the second significance of Christ's ascension it's the the pouring out of the blessings the accomplishment it's not that Christ died and rose again and he's sent in high and now all of his that he bought are continuing on in ignorance. No, he's, he's actually by his spirit right now through the preaching of the gospel, calling out each one. That's the only reason any one of us knows anything about this and can rejoice. And then the final point here is that his ascension into glory is a reminder also that even though he is removed, when it says he ever lives to intercede, it's not that there's more to be done in order to save his people. But it shows something of his care for his people yet on this earth who, who he said will suffer. He told them that if they have, have uh, persecuted him, they'll persecute you. Nobody's going to suffer for believing in this modern day popular Jesus that everybody loves and isn't he so sweet no the Jesus that always the world has opposed and continues to oppose today and will be in your families when you make clear and plain to them that the Christ of scripture is not this Jesus that they're worshiping you want to start a fight over a Thanksgiving dinner just start talking about who is Christ but that's why he ascended and now he's enthroned and like he said before he ascended and I am with you always even unto the ends of the earth I don't know about you but that's given me more comfort over the years that the Lord has had me preaching the gospel I can remember certain places very remote out in Africa at night lying on a bamboo uh, pallet looking up the stars and wondering what on earth I was doing out there where I was and yet the Lord had sent me there to preach the gospel and it comforted me to know that there was no place I could go even though I had no contact with family or the rest of the world that even there the Lord was directing it must be that there was a sheep somewhere because the Lord never sends any of his servants on a fool's errand I'm thankful that's that's it so to me the ascension and the enthronement of Christ on the throne is his continuing care. Just like he had their names written on his breast when he went to the cross. Guess what? In glory, he's going to have everyone for whom he paid the debt. If we could invite Stephen back today as they stoned him to death. And Saul stood having had the, the clothing of those that were stoning him laid at his feet. If you look in Acts chapter 7 and verses 55 and 56, this would be Stephen's testimony. Stephen, where was the Lord when they were stoning you? Well, here's what Luke writes about it in uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 55. It says there in 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth that's an amazing thing to be so angry at a word 
where he exalted the Lord Jesus Christ, who had already been crucified, risen, and ascended on high. That's what he was declaring. That they literally gnashed on him with their teeth. That's why when the scriptures say that there's hell will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, it's not going to be out of pain. It's going to be anger. Hell will be full of sinners that are angry at a sovereign God that has placed them where they are. And uh, gnashing of teeth. But he, speaking of Stephen now, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and what? Saw the glory of God. Who is the glory of God? Well, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Represented in the Old Testament, that Shekinah glory, type picture of prophecy, but now come live, die, and rose again, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. He was seated, but when it came to welcoming Stephen into glory, that's why I say those since the cross, they don't go into a place called Abraham's bosom. That's been cleaned out. When he ascended, he took all of those souls with him. Their bodies still await the final resurrection, just like any of us that die. But to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Here he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. That's why when Christ encountered Saul on the road to Damascus. He asked him, how long will you kick against the pricks? He'd heard Stephen's message. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he what? Fell asleep. Fell asleep because he was to be, he that believeth on me, Christ said, shall never die. The bodies asleep but the soul is with the Lord so all of this should be of great encouragement to us I trust it is for you when we particularly feel weak in ourselves and I do daily I know the weakness of my own flesh but here Luke is reminding us that the exalted Christ has given us his spirit he earned this by his death and now he's equipping, he's empowering, and giving to his people this boldness and assurance of faith to live out their lives so long as the Lord so purposes. We're all living out a life sentence, you know that? I kind of joke about when I wake up in the morning, open my eyes, oh yeah, I'm still serving a life sentence. So get up and get up and get about it. You know, the Lord has put us here to glorify his name and that's what he's doing he's granting repentance and revealing to those that he's redeemed that forgiveness of sin, sins and he is that savior and king that seeks and what saves that which is lost he's not going to lose a one that means we don't have to try to manipulate people when we go about testifying of Christ we can be confident that every one that the Lord has purposed, he will indeed draw them. So ends our study on the miracles. I hope that it's been beneficial for you. Nearly a year now that we've been in this. Some have been asking me, what are we going to do next? Where are we going next? Well, I am going to be beginning a study of all the names of our Lord Jesus in the scriptures and these are going to be in alphabetical order you say well, what what are we talking about well there's over a hundred so if it took us <laughs> a year to go through the miracles and I, I forget now how many there are but that we went through but the names probably going to keep us busy for about two years if the Lord gives life so I look forward to that. The very first one we're going to look at next time, because it's going to be in alphabetical order, it's Adam. That's one of the names that was given to Christ. 
The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. That's out of 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So that's how we're going to do it. He's called the Amen. He's called the Alpha and Omega. We just keep going right on down through the alphabet. He's called, uh, he's called the Elect. He's called the Everlasting Father. He's called the Forerunner. So I look forward to that study with you.